introduce to you um, Ross Lovegrove, who amazingly has never lectured at the AA, but I've been looking at his work for quite a while and I think it fits very well into the kind of research in new media of design and organic form you're doing at the DRL. Um, I'm a great fan of his work and I think he's, you'll see that uh, uh, he's a, f a huge talent and a kind of virtuoso also designer also in terms of drawings and I hope you see some of the sketches. I had the privilege to go through some of the sketchbooks. He's one of the designers I think um, um, who is not only has a huge kind of amount of clients and perfectly slick and polished products on the market over many years and uh, also early on in his life he had some st uh, great kind of stunts with Sony Walkmans and Apple computers etc and had made a name for himself but who continuously kind of quests and goes beyond this kind of finished product out in the market and does some real research into kind of new typologies of cars and new concepts of, of also urban living and he showed some of some of these glimpses at the uh, latent utopia where we, as you know the DRL had also a piece to show and I think it's a, it's a great moment uh, of convergence also with architecture uh, this kind of research uh, education institution and designers and we should include industrial designers and they actually I think Ross is one of those who is craving also for the kind of discourse of architecture who is perhaps a little bit more kind of developed and outreaching and far-reaching than sometimes the kind of scene in industrial design circles as I understand and I think anyway I, I wouldn't um, bore you with much of my adulation <laughs> you judge for yourself uh, welcome Ros Lovegrove <clears throat> okay um, well thank you very much Patrick Um, I have the privilege of being a friend of Patrick's and Zaha's, so um, there is a bias towards uh, <coughs> what he thinks of me. <coughs> now, it, in many respects, it is a great privilege to come and talk here, and um, not that it makes much difference, but I've refused probably my last five or six lecture invitations because I, I'm somebody who needs to kind of get my mind together um, in a very clear way and sometimes lecturing doesn't do that. Um, the AA is a formidable institution and um, I've been aware of the AA f you know, since I studied at the Royal College more than 20 years ago um, when in fact it <clears throat> unfortunately there wasn't much of a promotion for students there to kind of mix with students here. It was really quite sad and um, people I studied with like Daniel Weil, um, this group later made that crossover um, uh, quite successfully I think um, and then helped the Royal College understand perhaps new ways of teaching so coming here today I'm very aware in many ways of, of how this institution operates and I like it very much um, one thing that troubles me or has troubled me over the years and I'll share this with you is um, is a sadness of the lack of debate that exists within the world of industrial design. Industrial design, by definition, sounds like a pretty boring uh, job, being an industrial designer. You know, I meet people when I travel, and, I, you know, and they might think I'm some financier or actor. I tell them I'm an industrial designer, and they just look the other way. So it's, <laughs> it's a, an unfortunate title I've been f fighting with all my life to, to give some glamour and excitement to, because I do think when you look around you, um, from a light switch to a pair of shoes, to this, to a water bottle, to a laptop, to the carpet, to the shoe, uh, to the chair, to the watch, whatever, it's all been designed mainly by industrial designers, not architects. So we, we tend to deal with the smaller scale bitty stuff in life. And it's that bittiness which actually contributes to a kind of bittiness in the profession and a, and a lack of def definition. But within that profession, uh, are great resources and when I was at, was at the Royal College at the beginning of the 80s uh, I used to drive my professors nuts because they could never find me I'd basically be up in textiles, <laughs> I'd be in ceramics, I'd be messing around with a bit of glass and it wasn't promoted and, um, and not liked and for me obviously this investigation of other worlds is fundamental you can't walk down the street and, sit and not look at a car because you don't design cars or don't look at fashion because you're not a fashion designer. I mean, you, 
we, we have an opinion. And often when I'm interviewed, uh, people say, well, how on earth can you design a car or a cutlery or whatever? It's such different things. And I say, well, basically because I have an opinion in life. I, I use, I design most of the things I use. So, um, and I, there's nothing I design that I don't use. <laughs> so, ultimately, my design is my opinion. But it's my opinion on behalf of many, many people who I feel might think the same way, who might want to be stimulated by a kind of joy, a logic, and um, a kind of beauty of materialism um, in our everyday life. So, <clears throat> I, uh, I won't go on too much, but I mean, I, when I left the Royal College, I I, before I left a year, a year before I left, I got a job with Frog Design, they called me. Frog design sounds like a pretty naff outfit, um, and it did to me actually, it did sound pretty naff, uh, in the middle of the Black Forest. Uh, but within a month of leaving the Royal College, I was designing the first Sony Walkmans, I was working on all the first Apple products, so I was thrown in at the deep end. And you would learn, for example, w literally within a month, that what made, say, an Apple computer different from a, an IBM or, or anything else was that um, they, you know, Frog Design developed what they called zero draft, which meant no angles on the molding. It's a bit like a jelly mold without any angles on it. So to release that mold, that, that plastic product from the tooling, you have to do what they call split core tooling, where you pull out the middle, then all the bits collapse into that space and then open out. Well, that's pretty complex stuff even just trying to understand that. And then ultimately it's not reflected in the product. I mean, the consumer won't know that, but they, they'll certainly look at that box and think, it's square, it's absolutely purely square. And that subtle nuance is something that um, opened my eyes. I really opened my eyes to all this potential. <clears throat> and the same, same was true working with companies like Sony, you know, where I developed the Sony clip, which was actually at that time the smallest Walkman in the world, because I realized that the, um, that the cassette itself um, seemed to have enough structure and material in it to support the tape, and there's no point putting anything else around that. So, you know, there is there's a sense of economy, too, in the work that I do. Um, it's difficult being an industrial designer because um, there's so much rubbish around in the world. We, we, are, we are absolutely... Uh, capable of producing the world's worst things. And um, you, know, you can sit on a beach and there's some plastic can bobs up and says hello to you, you know, you're on, the, you know. It, it's unreal. So I don't want to sound too precious, but everything I'm involved in, I feel it, it, I try to understand why it should exist. And then I try to come to terms with trying to produce something which has an iconographic status of that thing. And then like David Bowie or even Madonna, you know, every six or seven years you reinvent yourself, you stay up to date. And that's what I try to do. Um, you know, rain or shine, that is what I do. And now we live in an age where with new technologies uh, stimulated through computing, um, there are new possibilities to make, to make uh, form and material and to put those together in exciting ways. So. At the moment, my work goes, you know, I work with Issey Miyake, I work with Vitra, uh, I, you know, I have, I have a little bit of a dabble with Gratz and other things I'm interested in within the architectural world, and I'll show you a few of those things as long as you don't laugh. Um, <laughs> and so my work is very much, it has no polarity, it's absolutely blurring through, through worlds. And there are days I wake up and I am, I really don't know who I am and where I fit. Uh, but, you know, I'm only in my early 40s, so I'm hoping that when I do wake up that one day, it'll, it'll come together in perhaps architectural terms where you can go from a small object to a big object, all in some kind of amazing, seamless way. So I do have kind of dreams and visions, um, and I'll just show you a few things today that kind of led, lead me to where I am now. Okay. Um, At the Royal College, I, uh, when I was there, it was the period of, um, it was the big period of Memphis. So basically all my colleagues were going into the workshop and um, getting a block of wood, covering it with styrene to make it very tight, and then spraying it pink and putting a palm tree on it and saying it was a fax machine. 
right? And I'm not joking, that was how it was. Got away with murder. Um, and I, I didn't get into that at all. I, I went there for a sort of education. So I, I worked on a few things like a digital camera um, and some weird uh, equestrian, I, I studied saddles and the way they constructed saddles. And I did absolutely stuff that was so different than anybody else. I thought they were going to throw me off the course. But um, in a sense, um, I didn't see the point of, of replicating something that was being done very well by very famous people like Satsas. I, I didn't need to learn what they were doing because I'm more interested in form. So it doesn't mean to say I dismissed that type of work, but I was looking at organic shape. So in at the end of the 70s, early 80s, I did a camera, which I'll, sh I'll just show you because I never really show it, but you might be interested. Um, Okay, so I'll show you what happens with the benefit of time and technology. So I'll show you two cameras that are spaced by roughly 10 years. Uh, so there's this one. Okay, it's not very organic, but okay, it's a start. Uh, that's the front. And the film is on the back, and it's a disc which is hermetically sealed. It's made like a Coke can, and it snaps on the outside because you only need to reveal a 9 by 11 aperture, which means you don't need a box to keep it dark. Yeah, so you ring-pulled this thing, and you snapped it on the back, and it had all the graphics on it and everything. And basically, to process it, you put a little sticker on it, put it in the post, uh, you know, and they send it back to you. I did it as a response to Kodak, who produced a thing called the disc camera, which was a stupid box, if you remember it. And, I, and for me, the rule is, when technology, new technology is available, that gives you the right to change the kind of visual typology of, of the product. Yeah? So if somebody comes up with a steam iron that only needs a very thin edge, what would that look like? Yeah, gives you free range to actually go right, right over the top and define absolutely a new typology of an object, which is what I try to do there. This is coke can thin aluminium over a polycarbonate shell. Uh, this is um, this bit here is the um, the lens, and it's sharp. So if you touch it, you touch something sharp, you know you're making a mistake. This is a pivot point pressed in, and this is the flash, which actually iconographically replaces the lens. Without that, this could look like some cutting tool. <laughs> it's interesting, no? So, you know, um, and I made that. I made this product um, on the lathe. <laughs> and um, so that, that, that product there, when you picked it up, it felt amazing in the hand. And when you put it against the face, it felt quite warm because of the air inside the product. Yeah? So I was thinking then about the physicality of everyday things. So 10 years later, when digital technology came about, I did this, which, um, okay. Uh, this one. Right, and see how that changed, because that's really me. That's when you know, I really feel part of that thing. And, um, it's elastomeric, which means it's, it's, it's rubber, it's a silicone. And the PC board and everything is inside that product. And it's not designed. It's what I call hydroelastically formed, which means that you make molds where you put in, that's a hole, and this is uh, an eyepiece, and then these are some connectors. And basically, you put that on like a chassis, and then you mold you've got a rubber you've got a rubber sheet between those and then you pour in the material and it just forms between the points that you need so really it's not designed it's designed by kind of natural forces and i did that in 1988 and uh, this was for um, olympus as a study they asked me to conduct a study into an ultimate camera digital camera and um, the problem with everyday objects is, uh, is this terrible sense of preciousness. And you obviously don't sense it so much in architecture because you don't really interact. You don't touch architecture as such. You might walk on floors, but the, the physical domain of architecture means you, you're not a destructive force. Whereas with, with products, they're, they're normally nomadic. 
So with a normal camera, even the lovely one you might own today, if you drop it, it, it breaks. And I think that's disgraceful. That means that that product doesn't live with you in life very well. If you own a very precious pair of shoes, a very precious car, and a few precious objects, your life is a misery. You lie in bed thinking somebody's running a key down your car or whatever it is. So, I mean, it's, my view was to try and use technology to make very natural, everyday products. And uh, when I presented this in Tokyo, I mean, they, they gave me a kind of, there was only five of them, but they gave me a, a bit of a clap, a standing ovation. But they didn't, they didn't make it. And the reason they didn't make it was that they probably wouldn't sell another camera. And that was what they said, because the thing is kind of an ultimate. There is no moving parts. You can clean the lens with your shirt, which you're not allowed to do normally. Um, it's, you can drop it in the water. You can hang it on a tree. It cost 99 pounds, as it was. So it was too far. So with a lot of things I'm involved in, I, um, I have a problem designing only for this moment in time. And one of the problems is most products take three or four years. So of course, if you are contemporary, it means you are out of date by the time that thing comes to the market. So, and you probably know that again, that's still something within the architectural frame that, um, that relates. Um, but that product came about through, you know, various studies, which, you know, not about money or anything. I mean, these are just studio studies of, of form through balloons and, and so on, which is a very natural way that I work. Um, often, when you deal with, with manufacturers, they don't understand any intellectual debate. It's a very difficult story. And uh, this is why today, and I don't want to kind of defame any of my contemporaries, but you know, there, are, there are some very well-known people out there who, who can't speak. They cannot articulate why they've done something. And I'll just say this, what looks modern and what is modern are two very different things. All that seduction you see with a bit of color in magazines is, you know, you can put color on anything, it's free. But to get down to the root, the absolutely core root of invention, you have to almost relate to what I call evolutive purposes, which means, you know, if you look through the, the, nature, the history of life, I mean, I, I have this amazing insect at home, which is a stick insect, uh, which originally had wings, and then apparently for 100 million years it didn't have wings, and then 50 million years ago, it grew wings again. I mean, there's this kind of response, a response to the environment. And a lot of my work, if you were blind, you would understand it because it has very much physical connections. It's the movement of man. It's the feel of the hand. It's how the way I would like to define space is actually quite primordial. I'd like to produce very organic space, um, f space that feels like it's eroded by man's movement. And this is not a new thing to me. I've been thinking about that for 20 years. Just haven't quite worked out how to make it. But ultimately, th this will be possible. And this will become so natural to everybody instead of you know, building bricks and mortar. And this is the crossovers between something like an elastomeric camera and other, you know, when you see a thing like that big, it moves your heart. It, you know, if you make a big model of something like that, it's unreal. It becomes very abstract, abstract and extremely um, sculptural. <clears throat> so, in a way, I'm trying to combine beauty and logic, but there's this total uh, sculptural value that I'm trying to create through everything I do. Um, okay. Let's close that up. I just while, I, while I've got that open, I'll just show you. Just, you know, I mean, just uh, the object quality of it and the fact that it has this extremely hydrogenated but yet controlled form. It's somewhere between a product and a fish. And I mean, we can produce materials now where, you know, you can have anything you want from you can have your transparency, but you can also have things floating in that transparency. You can have it soft, you can have it rigid, semi-rigid, soft, all in the same product. So you get um, you know, a coexistence of, of, of physicality within objects, which could be very beautiful. I mean, the thing which challenges that, and I, I'm not sure again if that remotely relates to architecture, but you know, these things have 
a fairly um, short shelf life, which means that if you join materials together and they need to be recycled, it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare. So you've got big uh, e uh, ecological issues to deal with. I'm working on a collection of tableware, um, teapots and coffee stuff at the moment for an Italian company with glass or ceramic and plastic which is bonded onto it which makes it really interesting. I mean, visually, it's pretty amazing. But ecologically, it's terrible. <laughs> so how do you deal with that? Because um, basically, I can talk them out of not doing that project. Because you, know, you, you tap a glass in the kitchen on the tap, and it's cracked, and you've got to throw it away. So there's, you know, that's, that side of life is not worked out. So if you do see things which are rather dull, because they might be a mono material, there are good reasons for that. And we, we can't fight that because that's very beautiful, the idea of things which have a symbiotic uh, role in our life. Yeah, they come into our life and they go out of our life, but they have an organic quality in their physicality too, in the way that they have a birth, life and death. And that's something that we have to deal with very much w within the world of manufacture. Okay, so that was some fairly early stuff. I mean... I just pick out a few things here. Um, a lot of what I'm involved in has a kind of sequential relationship. So, uh, for example, some years ago, uh, Herman Miller came to me in the U from the U.S. and said, uh, "Could I work on an environment instead of a chair or a desk? Could I think about a total environment and how to create that?" Well, that's a fantastic challenge. And if you know your history of uh, 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 the Eameses and so on. Uh, George Nelson. There were great things done by the American modernists. I mean, all that wonderful organic form really came out of America with, with Saarinen and so on. And, and they were encouraged because at that time, when they were working predominantly, say, in the 40s, there was this wonderful relationship between somebody like uh, Eames and Le Corbusier. I mean, they knew each other. They, they met each other. They talked. So there, there were only kind of a handful of people around the world, you know, from Mies and so on, who were very aware of what everybody else was doing. And there was still that very strong influence that came from the turn of the century through African art, Cubism, Picasso. There was all of that that was coming, this form, this discovery of form. Um, and a kind of humanistic way of, of working, even though there was a deep frustration in, in the inability to make. Um, so when I'm sort of contracted by a company like Herman Miller, I have a, an immediate kind of emotional flood of, of historical position. And I think, bloody hell, perhaps I could do the most amazing plywood office. I'll just blow the lid off. I'll take plywood to its limits. You know, but, but that's a dream because ultimately um, it burns and it does, you know, it, it's expensive to put together and blah, blah, blah. And it doesn't have any... It has a particular physicality, but it has a very old physicality in many ways. So what I looked at was, and I can show you now, is um, the idea of how you, how you build space within space. And the problem with office systems, for example, is you've got the, it's the problem of, of connecting and transferring power and data through space. And basically, they put it in desking. But if the end of your desk stops, that's the end of it. <laughs> They can put it in a panel. If the panel stops, so does your power and data. You can put it in the ceiling, but you've got to get up there and you've got to come back down out. So what I did was I developed a floor, uh, an amazing flooring system, which is made from uh, pressed steel, uh, made by an automotive company in uh, Holland, Michigan, uh, which clipped together. You could air freight it with UPS, and then everything else plugged into that. And what that allowed me to do was to put also the structure in the floor, which then liberated the surfaces. And the surfaces now become incredibly thin, transparent, and plastic. So you've got to find that little mechanism that allows the logic to be passed through. And um, I just, I like looking at these. I'll show you this. Uh, OK. This is the tile. That's a tile. That's a pressed tile with these little plastic uh, tops. Yeah? And they have little holes in them here. And it means that you can plug into those. So you start with that component. 
which is roughly 300 by 300. And then that will give you this surface. that which is the zinc passivated finish which is very beautiful but you know that like, like a shopping trolleys and this is that lovely gold zinc passivated finish it's the cheapest and actually it looks the most beautiful um, so that you can put down ad infinitum it means that you could move into a warehouse overnight <laughs> lay this floor you can put the whole system together in probably an hour and then when you leave you take it with you too and because it's designed in a way to uh, respond to developments in, in power and data transmission, a product like that might even last you 15 or 20 years, which is unheard of. So you start with that, and then just to show you, uh, you put a top tile down, which is a double sandwich pressing with a hole matrix in it. And then into those squares, because architecturally speaking, I mean, the grid is a very useful thing. <laughs> for planning. Uh, so into those squares you can put bamboo, you can put lino, you could put carpet, God forbid. You, you can put anything you want onto those squares that allow you to define high wear areas, wares where you have a lot of computing so you need anti-static surfaces. You can do a lot of things with that grid. And then into that you can plug these legs which take a surface so these legs aluminium legs you see they plug in just in here like with special pins and then it allows you to produce these honeycomb super lightweight surfaces and the, I had a real fight I mean this took me four years this is Holland Michigan every month um, they told me that plastic was not possible for work surfaces because a normal work surface has to resist um, uh, a 1000 pound load test these survive 4,000 pounds. And if you can see, I'll show you in a minute, they have this amazing sculpt, sculpted spine out of the same honeycomb matrix. And I mean, the beauty of just these ob objects, these elements, when they're lit, was remarkable. And my idea was that what you would do is use the new Artemide lighting system, which gives you different color variations. And you come in in the morning and you want to feel fresh, you have a yellow office system. Press a button get to lunchtime you might want a light blue one I mean you change the physicality of your space through light but I was trying to do it with a mainstream manufacturer with a world renown and a world market I was really trying to bring these ideas to people and I'm telling you you have to be this incredible politician you have to go sit through meetings where they talk such rubbish and you have to stick with it to try and get them to follow your ideas because you know somebody will come along and say I don't know, it scratches, or uh, uh, I don't know, my mother won't like it, or, you know, there, there are really stupid reasons why things don't get manufactured. Um, and there are very stupid reasons, of course, why buildings don't get built. But you can go, you could go, you know, three years and 300 days, and on the, the next day they could cancel the project through politics or any, any other reason. So um, some of the pieces are, are really quite elegant. Um, this is the connection underneath, uh, which is this, and these are rubber. These are rubber connectors, and what you do by hand, literally, is you turn that, and that expands into the. Uh, it's a hole, basically. It's not a. It's not a hexagon, but it's a hole provided, so you've got instant location. Um, and then, when the thing, when you get going with um, with light. For example, I'll show you this first. This table, this table, it's called the teardrop table, and it has, again, this honeycomb structure on the top, but the shape underneath you can't really see from here. But if you, if you illuminate it, it becomes quite amazing, this thing. Um, like that. That's in that thing and that's injection molded. Yeah? I mean, albeit it's one of the biggest injection moldings that you can make, but it's done. And um, from that, you know, I mean, it's interesting when you look at the new Herzog and de Moron project for Prada in Oyama with the, the kind of triangulated panels. I mean, that really makes the hair stand up on the back of my neck because I think it's really beautiful. And I think this proximity now between 
There's n there is no furniture that complements the mood in architecture today. There's nothing out there. I mean, at least with Patrick and Zaha, they basically are developing furniture typologies as they go along. But there's very few architects that, you know, Frank and so on, have, have tried. But there is not enough proximity. And I'm wondering what's going to fill that wonderful architecture, because it's certainly not quite what we have at the moment. And there aren't enough designers thinking about it. Anyway, um, for example, the floor tiles. I'll just I'll do this. I'll do this another way. Okay. Just show you this because I like to zoom in. You see the floor tiles stacked. They're they're very beautiful. Please bear with me. Okay. No, because when things become multiplied, they take on a whole new meaning. And you can, you know, you can work in the studio on a new product and you can envisage the individual item. But when you see something manufactured, you can walk in a factory and there are thousands or, or tens of thousands of them. I mean, it's a really amazing feeling. And I, it's not a, it's part, I think it's partly a power trip, but at the same time, it's this sense that all these people involved in this process believe in what you do and they press the button, they've made it. And that's amazing. The confidence that all the factors that need to come together to produce something are in line and they go for it. And that's, that's a really great feeling. And I mean, the reason I pulled that up this way is that if you, you know, if you, if you get into this, it's really great, you know. Oh, yeah, over here. This is great in here. Look at that. Look at that. Wow. I mean, <laughs> see what I mean? Whoa. Not too far enough. I want to get in a bit deeper in here. This is, this is my life in here. This is, you know, this is like bodies. This is like muscles. You know, yeah. And that's how I see my work. And uh, of course, I, I have to temper that view in these meetings with people because they don't get it. They don't. They absolutely think I'm a fruitcake. So I, you know, I've been fighting that. Um, still. Okay. It's, it's a bit. I've had a difficult day. There we go. All right. Um, yeah, this is a cool one. So you've got to sit through me going through this again because I'm gonna, I want to. Oh, here we go. No. This is a cube. Now, if you want to um, create volume in a in a space, you have to take the skyscraper theory, which means you go up. Yeah, it's like a it's like me standing up or lying down. I mean, I take infinitely less space standing up than I do lying down. And in offices where space is really a factor, it's a big premium. You know, storage should go up. So these are gas-injected, high-impact polystyrene cubes. Never been done before. And if you go in, you can't probably see from where you are, but if you go in deep in there, can you see that? These are all, these are air pockets. And they're all kind of irregular, because that's where the air goes in, and that's what it does. And they were, they were moaning to me, saying it didn't look good enough, because it wasn't uniform. But the air pockets are what makes it really interesting, you know, like nature again. So and if you see these things in reality, they're really lovely and they're very light and very strong. You know. And a, and a thing like that takes one year, one year of your life to do. I mean, these, these are huge time frames involved in, in, in working all this stuff out. I mean, if you see that, that piece with light again. Yeah it starts to really come alive. So actually when you go inside the cube you know, by accessing it, uh, documents or whatever, it's as beautiful as it is outside. And of course it comes alive with the light. You know. So, you know, one of my dreams, I mean, it's funny because every morning when I take my son to school, I go past the Serpentine Pavilion and uh, I've watched every, every pavilion go up over the years. Um, in the bad weather, which is quite soul-destroying. 
and uh, Oscar's is sagging to one side at the moment. I don't know what's going on there. Uh, but one of my dreams would be to, to build, a, let's say, the first plastic pavilion there. And what I'd like to do is you know, I'll show you today a little bit of, of, of some of the processes that I think could allow us to work on plastic buildings. To how do we get to a plastic building? Because um, it's not a question of, you know, it's like, um, it's not a question of mimicking what exists. It has to find its own new language. Before, I, I did ask for a couple of speakers, so I don't know, did you have anything, any speakers? Uh, uh, no, it, we, can, we can come back to that if, if it's a problem. But in the tradition that, of Charles Eames, I have been making films, I make films to, to describe visually uh, what perhaps words you know, have difficulty in, in really expressing. Uh, that one. Yeah. Is that not it? Yeah, that should be the one. Right? Okay. So you wind up. Can I just have a go? Okay. There's no sound. It's on full here. So. But, you know, I produced this, 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 this film which shows the Pantheon in Rome, how you go from a granite block to um, a volcanic rock. And I relate the product to the concept of, you know, lightness, interconnectivity, um, systems in nature, systems that exist, for example, in uh, religious architecture for creating cathedral roofs. It's interesting because Herman Miller said to me, you can make the movie, because this was for a big show in Chicago, but we don't want any nudity, uh, what was it, no nudity, uh, no loud music, and no, nothing religious. So I got the churches in there, and I got some really good funky music. Um, I didn't get any nudity, unfortunately. I should have presented it naked. That would have warm, warmed them up. They're all Dutch Calvinists. It's very difficult. So, well... It's no good without the music, because the music's pretty good. Yeah. But you can see where some of my, my references come from, yeah? in, in terms of the origins of structure. And um, there's a couple of ways that you can look at structure. You can be totally intuitive about it, where you just feel the way things should be, or you scientifically work it out. Well, perhaps through computing now, we have a chance to scientifically work it out and then fuck around with it. So you actually get both, and that's, that's where it gets really interesting. Because I think that's really what the, the natural world does. Through mutation, it, it creates these very interesting things. And, you know, uh, um, strangeness is a consequence of quite progressive thinking. So when I see things which are pretty mainstream, not everything, but most, you know, when I see things perhaps in the design world, in Milan or whatever, another simple four-legged chair or whatever, I, you know, I can understand it, but it doesn't, it's really not pushing. You know, and there are people who push and there are people who, who just kind of follow that. And it, what I'm trying to do is find a way of making a living out of pulling and pushing. So, if you come over to my new studio, I do have a good sound system. You can have a bit of fun out of it. Okay. Um, I'll just, I'll, I'll run you through some stuff. This is, um, I may, I, I'm continuously experimenting with form, albeit in my own way. So, for example, this is a biowood collection. Um, I work with a company called Chicotti in Pisa. And th these are actually willow wood. So they're beautifully light and very silky to touch. And I'll just give you an example. These are not computer generated. These are me drawing and then I'll work with my model maker and that, that it'll go through a series of models. It'll go into grey foam and then it'll go into a hard resin material and at that point when I'm ready it'll be digitized and then we smooth it all out. 
So it doesn't go just from here to a screen and very, in a very detached form. It's very much uh, through the pen. And I don't want to sound old-fashioned talking to you about that, but there's a lot that I've done, including water bottles and chairs and things, which look like they've been produced on the computer, but they don't. They actually start from my mind and on paper. Um, and it, perhaps, it's, perhaps it's a generational thing, but if you look at the drawings of Henry Moore, if all Henry Moore did was drawings, they are remarkable. Even if he never sculpted, they are remarkable. Same with Leonardo. Um, they have an amazing way of describing form, you know, with this kind of chiaroscuro, this lines, many, many lines. And this really uh, was, a, was a prelude to the computer. I think those types of illustrators, you know, including Bridget Riley and all, all the, they were absolutely. They, they wanted to create some kind of three-dimensional precision. They just, they just didn't have the tools to do it. And if those people were alive today and they had the chance of working in the way that we work, I'm sure the forms that would come out would be remarkable because you have to have an eye for form. You know, and the reason that Henry Moore put a hole in his sculptures was not because it looked better. It was to unite one surface with another. If you just remember that within an architectural concept, it's very beautiful. Yeah? This is what I explored in Graz, so I was trying to do so, <clears throat> I'm not sure if I got it. These are some of the scans, you know. Right, you know, and you can see here that, that, I mean, this is just the hand model, and you can see that there's a terrible bump here, a bit of a bump, you know, you, you see. So, you know, take the bumps out, and then you're close to something which came from here. And this is the first thing I have ever done which doesn't have to function. <laughs> And believe you me, to spend your life trying to do functional objects that are interesting, it's a killer. Say, you know, you want to run away. You, you, you do. Yeah. And most things in my field are judged on their function. And that dries everything out. So there has to be some way to express. And if you can't do that every day in your products, in my case, I have to do it in my sculptural exploration. when one of these forms is just simply white, you look at that and you think, what an amazing computer image. Well, that's just a, a photograph with green, that's green light on the white model, on a light box. So, you know, I'm doing a book at the moment. I've had everything photographed over the last five years on white backgrounds so that they float. So you just read the object as it is. I can't totally explain what, what I show you there, but there's, there's something deep and very primordial in it. Um, which, for example, when I draw, I know because Patrick said I should show uh, uh, What have we got? Uh, let's see if there's anything in here. Nothing, I think. Yeah, I mean, these, these are not, this is nothing, but, you know, if you look at, um, you probably can't see that, but that's a sofa for Morozo. And uh, wait, what, I'm lo what I'm looking at is how one surface can come across and form the back, and the other one can sort of form the arm and a bit of the back and support the back. So it's a kind of beginning. And these are computer, they're done on a computer tablet. So they, the lovely thing about a computer tablet is it's frictionless, so you actually skid around everywhere, and you can airbrush. So this, this is stuff I do on the, on the computer. Um, and I like that fluidity that the, the Teflon tablet gives you. Um, I don't think I have anything else in here. Um, this is, this is, a, this is a so, oops. Yeah, so just kind of in that world. And I mean, a product like that uh, could become upholstered, just simple upholstered thing. It could be made in PU soft foam and sprayed like the bumper of a, of a Porsche. So it has a sort of minimum in impact quality, which no manufacturer wants to make, by the way. I've been trying to force them to do that for years and nobody wants to do it. Um, or it could be made in aluminium and sold at Philips in New York. Yeah for a hundred grand or something like, you know, it can be that kind of, it can go whichever way it needs to go. Um, 
I kind of like the last one, but somebody's got to pay for it. I mean, and they can look, they can look like, um, you know, they could come out. These are tables for Capellini. They're, they're, they're called fluid, and they're all aluminium. So they're just amazing floating uh, objects. Um, but if you, um, while I've got that open, I mean, I work with numbers of companies. If you look at, this is my work with Fregetto in, uh, in Vicenza. These, these simple table and chairs, that's a fiberglass table. But what it shows is something that's it's ongoing in my work, and this is the positive-negative thing. It's about what is the space that's created by human intervention and then cleaned up. So basically, it does have four legs, but the legs are created by the, the negative shapes that are created. And I had an exhibition in Tokyo where I had like a whole series of these tables in amazing colors. And I projected, I had movies playing in these pockets, and it was kind of really weird. It was really good. And I had them all stacked up in a bright orange, like five high, and they looked really great. But these are, rot these are glass fiber, and of course they have a value. Uh, but they're quite expensive. I mean, for that, you would pay two and a half thousand pounds. Whereas if you roto-molded that, because the tooling is very cheap, and I'm going to come round to that. If you roto-molded that, you could sell those for 300 pounds. And it would actually be more accessible and quite interesting. So the problem I have is I've designed this for a company, and I would love to make them roto-molded. They don't want to question is, can I myself do it and contravene my contract? I don't, because I would like to do that. And the tooling for a, a, a product like that um, would be nothing more than 20 to 25,000 pounds, which means you don't have to sell so many to get your money back. And I did a whole program with a company called BD, BD in um, Barcelona in the last two or three years, which I, I'll show you. I mean, while I've got this, let's just have a look at this. this is, um, this is what I do with Fregetto too. I look at organic wraparound surfaces and things that, in, you know, uh, they envelope the body in some way. And this is an area where I try to take some sense of ownership because I've been working in this field for a long time about things which actually wrap around you. And, but the surfaces are wonderfully practical because at the end of the day you do need to satisfy that. So. This big surface here, it's lovely. You can sit here, you can have your laptop. My son, I can put his clothes here, his school books here, and something else there, and his breakfast. And I can get him out the door in one sofa, <laughs> which is pretty good. Yeah. What a sal sales line that is. It's amazing. No, but this is for magazines, so it's square. And this is for putting stuff on, so it's not. So it's in very simplistic terms. but. I'm supported by companies who want to try and turn these thing, things into fairly mainstream products to sell. Okay, show you this BD stuff because it's quite interesting. Um, good. Um, where are we? Over here. Okay, roto molding. I mean, BD is a company that um, is, was founded by a number of arch architects. Even somebody like Moneo is involved. Uh, but mainly it's Oscar Tutskets, uh, Blanca, who's the main thrust behind it. And they are editors of, of furniture in Barcelona. And they make all the remarkable Gaudi pieces, and they're very proud of it. Yeah, so this organic thing, Spain it all very well connects. And they came to me a few years ago and said, could I design a piece? And I said, well, OK, you make cast aluminum and you make wood, so I'm going to make plastic. <laughs> and they just didn't know how to begin. Um, and I said, look, just trust me, because we, we, we'll do something that, let's do it first. Let's make something and show it. And then if you like it, we'll go on, yeah? because there are industrial manufacturers of rotor moldings in Spain, and we'll find them, and I'll help you, and we'll go on. So basically, um, I worked on a program of a bench, and then there's a bench with a light, and a planter, and a bin. And the first thing we did was we, you know, for example, this is that's the first sketch up here. This is a very liquid form. So 
it, it's the, I, I, what, I, what I was looking to do. This is trying to bring sculpture, um, human organic form and color to the outside environment. That's what I've been trying to do. So these are kind of like living sculptures. And they, because <clears throat> if you look at most public furniture, it's pretty, it, it's all anti-vandal, which means it's, it's built in a particular way and it's extremely aggressive, very Germanic, very gray. And there's a chance to bring some joy through process to the outside world. So I began with this bench. And um, again, the, the, the cost of tooling something like that is not very much. And this is sort of how it came out. Like that. They're big. They're the biggest piece of furniture, manufactured furniture in the world. They seat 10 people. <laughs> and they stack, as a matter of fact, too. Um, and there's a reason why they stack. They, if you want to sell these to anywhere outside of where they're manufactured, you have to make sure they fit in the container. So if you want to sell these in Australia, they have to stack in an amazing way within a rectangular box. So what you see is not exactly, you know, it's not totally the package. I mean, the whole thing has to be thought through. Um, they're made in polyethylene, and that's the material that you get on all those, when you go um, to a, a marina, all those big plastic shapes that you see, those boys, those things they hang on the side of boats, they're all made in rotor-molded polyethylene. And they're very beautiful, some of them, some of those fantastic colors. Okay, you have to have a UV resistor in it, uh, which is an extra cost, but it's possible, and, and my products do. So, um, I'll just show you. These are their photos. See, that's it. Which is pretty exciting, I think, to see that. And um, so, yeah. And then, literally a week or two ago in Milan, uh, we launched. Um, the, the bench with the light on it. And this is it. In the fact, this is in the factory in Valencia. Uh, that's the base without the top. And as you look at these images, you've kind of got to look around the factory. Yeah? I mean, this is a factory that makes all those, kind of, all these rotor molding factories, they make the chemical containers which are fairly anonymous uh, for all sorts of purposes but the beauty of them is they stack and when you see them en masse they are a building they are a building they're very beautiful for it but I mean obviously somebody's got to get in there and give some form and a bit of logic to it um, and off you jolly well go so I'm trying to talk this company in, into <laughs> trying to do a car and then eventually doing building components so we've gone from a company that does Gaudi wooden car products to this <laughs> in three years and they're happy because they sell I mean they sell like hotcakes so you know most of the time people don't pay any attention to the, the technological details of a product but I think that's really beautiful underneath and it and it in a way it's sort of not designed by me it's where all the connectors and everything have to go but if you took that aesthetic again and you reversed it out you put plumbing systems and lighting systems and God knows what through it why not uh, so this is it with the it's got a rotor molded top spike and it has to have this stainless steel collar because you get a heating up of the light and of course um, if it heats you and it's inside it'll expand and it'll break the product and it's also a kind of gesture towards anti-vandalism so you've got yeah so that's the thing we, what we've done is cut one in two and I don't know if you know this process but it's remarkable. It's, uh, you know, when I was in school, I studied cooking. And I, I really, yeah, and I played rugby, worked that one out. Um, so I, and, I used to, and I used to mess around with, with, with food. And all those mille foy, all the way that you expand pastry and so on with air. I used to make, make mousses and so on. I'm sure that's why I'm designing with all these materials now, because I was fascinated. Um, so, you know, this is what you do is you make a model full-size model, which is CNC cut, of course, and then you refine it. And then what they do is they have a spray-on ceramic um, coating that then they make their first mold, and then they take that apart, and then they spray on aluminium, and then they'll clean it up. And that aluminium becomes your mold. You bolt it together. You put it on a spit, 
So it's basically hanging there. They put it on, and there's a fire, <laughs> there's gas fire underneath it, it's hanging there. They pour in plastic pellets, the pellets melt, they move this thing around like this for an hour or two, it swishes around, they stop, they let it cool, and there's a product, it's cooking, it's like slip casting. And it's, a very, it's the cheapest way that you can make plastic components. So if the world of architecture is going to move on, you can't get into injection molding and so on because that's, that's, that's too expensive. The tooling is too expensive. Um, this could be a way to do it through scale and uh, you know, e e economies of it all. So that was the factory. And I'll just sort of take that out. And this is just a photo shoot that we did in, in, Madrid, in Barcelona to show the product. So yeah, in lovely colors. Yeah. So it becomes funky, but actually it's logical. It's not, you know, it, it, it's exciting perhaps as a design, but at the same time it's all based on reasons. So these things in airports or kiddies' playgrounds or just any public space would be wonderful. You can fill them full of sand or water, so you basically can't move them. And, you know, you can, they're anti-vandal because this material is made it's the polyethylene is expressly there for chemical tank, tank manufacture. So it resists everything. It's remarkable. Yeah, and that's the underside with the light. And then illuminate. So, um, so that's that little kind of diversion. But whilst we talk about materials in plastic materials in, in architecture, potentially. I brought along a few samples. This is very new. This is produced by a company in Britain uh, which experimented with rotor molding of polycarbonate. The polycarbonate is very, very strong. It's used for anything from a contact lens to the uh, windshield of a fighter pilot, uh, you know, F-16. It's remarkable polymer, uh, the, 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 the polycarbonate and it has amazing optical qualities. Well, this doesn't, okay? But this is the first check time anybody's ever tried to rotor mold uh, polycarbonate. So you're basically melting a material and you're swishing around. So it doesn't have any controlled wall thickness. Uh, but, you know, at a distance, architecturally speaking, that is the closest you'll get to uh, having a, a non-glazed or whatever, a non-concrete building that has some transparency towards this field of of plastics, of polymer. And you, I pass that around if you want to have a, a quick look at it. No, I mean, why not? Um, <coughs> okay. So, I just want to, while I'm talking about that potential, I'll show you this EDRA project. This, uh, this was a chair that I did for a company called EDRA which work a lot with the Campana brothers. You probably know the products they make, very beautiful uh, experiments with bamboo or natural materials, uh, fantastic. And uh, they're the only Italian manufacturer that really is out there experimenting with, not, they don't experiment so much with uh, invested technologies, but they invest very much in construction methods. And the Campanas are really, they, if they're ever over in Europe, you should invite them along here, because Moshe, they're one of the, that few group I was telling you about with Marcel Wanders and so on, who are really interesting people. Massimo Morozzi, who was part of uh, ArchiZoom with Branzi and everybody in the 60s, great guy, he came to London and he said to me in his uh, Serge Ginsburg uh, smoky voice, I want something unexpected. Um, so I thought, probably want something square. Um, we don't, I couldn't wear it. And basically, he wanted me to look at new technologies. And for many years, I've been fighting with the concept of trying to use packaging technology for products. And I proposed to Apple many years ago that the, the polystyrene um, covers that, that the, these um, computers come in were used to form a desk for, for the child for the product. And they wouldn't have any of it, which is really sad because all that stuff's thrown away. And it's actually quite durable because it's not polystyrene, it's polypropylene. Um, so I developed this chair. This is an armchair, and it's called Air One, and it's made from beaded polypropylene foam. Yeah. 
this is the stool. Yeah. And that is basically packaging material. And it's, I mean, it is really strong. And it stacks. <laughs> yeah, everything has to stack. Uh, but, you know, it has structural integrity in the whole thing. And the, the, the chair itself is a very large piece. And you can get a, a little child, child holding it like, a, like an ant. It's very beautiful. And, and I, I work a bit with Toyo Ito. Uh, we have this sort of little affinity in our work where you know, I work with him on the MediaTek in Sendai. And so he asked me to produce the furniture for the last pavilion at the Serpentine. And um, so I use these chairs. And uh, I've got a few shots. I'll just show you first what I have here. Yeah, so what you do, it's a bit like one of those polystyrene cups you get in the canteen. If you hold them this way, they're very flexible. If you put them upside down, they become quite, really quite strong. So these are like upturned cups, but then you, you post-rib them this way. Again, it's aluminium tooling. You, you put the, um, it's, it's a foaming agent. So basically, you put the polypropylene and it foams up. And so you get, if you look closely at these, it's dark, but... Uh, you have all these wonderful little, I don't know if you can see these little, they look like uh, TB jabs on, on around. They're all air vents, and they actually create a very beautiful thing. Um, <coughs> so they, you know, they invested in manufacturing these pieces. Um, and the problem being is that when you I mean, kind of write product, and you could say wrong company, because Edra are craft-based companies, so they don't sell very much. So to get the price down for these, you have to make a lot, which means probably you know, hundreds of chairs that you have to keep in storage somewhere. So the cost of these is absolutely it's ridiculous. So there is a disconnect between people's perception and the product itself. But what I like here is these um, remarkable skin qualities that you get, this pixelization, which is something that's very interesting to me anyway, within the creation of larger structures. And I've been experimenting with Villa Matoazo and a few things, which again, I can show you. That was that image on the invitation. But the idea, if you want to make form, how do you do it? You can do it one way by going down so far in scale that you, you then can create form through modular um, multiplication. And I mean, if you could create, for example, polystyrene balls that had Velcro quality, and that's it. You, you know, I don't understand why you have to make a structure to support a structure. It's just, as a, as a designer outside of your world, I don't understand that. I think that is fundamentally wrong. You don't get that in nature. So it should be intrinsic, and this is what we're aiming towards. And I've had many conversations sitting on airplanes with Greg Lynn in the States going across the talking about how we make flexible tooling. So you make this amazing metal thing that changes shape, squirt, change shape, squirt. I mean, it's never been done. But I mean, wouldn't it be great if we could find a sponsor for something? I mean, it, it, it could be a project which would allow us to look at using all the computer technology to allow one mold to deform relative to data coming in. And then the issue of multiplicity in different forms doesn't, doesn't come into it. So it's either one thing reproduced or the thing morphing within itself through technological inve invention. So, yeah. And again, if you look inside, like the stool, it has this amazing cathedral-like quality. You know, which is a kind of religious thing, I suppose, with the light coming through. I never looked at it that way. Gosh. All right. I'm going to stop that. Um, but if you see these things um, in situ, they have a very nice quality. Uh, for example, this serpentine. Is there something? That's going to look in here. Uh -huh. okay. um, yeah, these are nice. I don't know what. what oh, okay. It's a few family shots there. <laughs> Oh, this is, another, this is another chair I did for Dria Day. But you, you, you know the project, of course. And what Ito likes about my work is the, is, is the form. And for this project at the Serpentine, it would have been very easy for him to have come out with some folded furniture element. 
But what he wanted to do, following on from the work we did at Sendai, was to complement the, 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 the triangulation of the form through the organic line. So um, that's what we showed. And that's, you know, that's, that was a typical scene. And it was very funny because I was, I was there one day and uh, these American people, the, I think in their, in their 60s, they walked over to, to sit on my chairs and the old lady sat in it and she said, oh, it's not comfortable, Bill. Let's go somewhere else. <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then meanwhile, a little girl walked across with one on her head and there was somebody sat somewhere else and I think they had their feet in one of the stools to keep them warm. So there was this, this weird social mix, which, you know, you, you know it, obviously she thought they were awful. But, you know. uh, so yeah, so just the way things kind of coexist. And then outside. And of course, at the Serpentine, they have very different events going on every night, so they have to move the furniture, so the stackability and lightweight quality is very important. But the stackability is something I keep repeating, but I know that the stackability will work in one's favor in terms of modularity and connectivity. So you get all of that right, then the whole process is, um, has this, um, this trinity. Okay, sorry, it's an old, old voice. I look, I, I look the oldest, don't I, by, by far? Okay, good. Okay, good. Um, okay while I'm in here, this was, um, I was approached about three years ago by um, a ceramic company in uh, Porto uh, called Matozo. And uh, they said, look, could I design uh, a building for them which would be a reception center uh, that would, um, it would be a home and a reception center. And it would be a place where they would really show off the concept of ceramics in um, architectural componentry because I did a project for Limoges. Uh, Limoges has this guest once a year, Ron Arad's done it, if you think of more, where you, you go down, you work with the companies in Limoges, basically in ceramics, to do something. And I produced a brick made out of foam ceramic where you make a foam, you, d you take foam, you dip it in ceramic and then you burn off the foam and you get this amazing ceramic block. And I made uh, a circular pavilion that was probably five meters across uh, with an amazing ceramic fountain thing in the, in the middle with plastic chippings around it. It was kind of, I don't have an image, but they came to that and they, they really loved that because I was trying to find a way to, to reinvent the brick, you know, because I mean, I've been to the Valley of the Dry in Morocco and I've photographed how they make bricks by cutting the mud and putting the straw in. I, and I'm fascinated by that because a brick is a very intelligent thing. And it, it's, it's been with us for so many, you know, uh, thousands of years and it's something that perhaps could be reinvented. Um, so that's what I looked at within the ceramic field because you get impermeability, you get connectivity, you get a lot of fantastic uh, qualities through ceramic, uh, which I tried to do. Um, Anyway, they came to me and said, could I design uh, this, this building? And uh, it was just outside of the Porto on the coast. Uh, <coughs> so I came up with this, uh, which this, this, this kind of view, I think, best describes it. This is the view from the back. So what you have is, this is the sea. Yeah, so this is the sea here, yeah, and then you've got a pebbly kind of coast. You've got very, very little around the building, and you know that coastline is extremely windswept, uh, very, uh, you know, it's, it's not, it's not, it's not a kind of sandy, attractive coastline. It's very, it has a very strong character to it. And so, my thought was this, uh, just in terms of planning of the building, and then I'll talk about how the building is made. This is the garage. This is storage. These become services like bathrooms and toilets. These are bedrooms. And then this is the television to the, to the ocean. And what that delivers is quite a, uh, an interesting possibility in that I've been thinking about extruded technology because extrusions are very easy to produce in most materials, as a matter of fact. So my thought was this, remembering that this will take 
say an Audi A2 aluminium car. Yeah? You begin with aluminium tube. It yeah? goes like this. And the aluminium slowly becomes ceramic. So you've got like a porcelain tube. So these are dense materials because these are storage areas and you don't really need any window um, space. So you've got aluminium to ceramic. And then what's interesting is around here it starts to become polycarbonate, crystal polycarbonate, not a really pure polycarbonate. And then here it becomes glass. So you have this metamorphosis of material. And the beauty of the thing about the tube is, and it's not demonstrated here, is that when you cut tubes through, you get amazing connectivity. So you can run these through into all these spaces. And you can plug things into the garden. So you get these matrices of tubes embedded. So even your flooring area, I developed a product, which they never made, but it was a, a cast aluminium series of holes that interconnected, a bit like the Boerlick Brothers foam things, if you've ever seen those, uh, which were embedded here. Basically, you fill them with asphalt, but you still see the aluminium. And then here it becomes that recycled rubber material for playgrounds. And then it becomes grass and sand. and you know. So you've got a clear relationship. And what you can do is you can plug in uh, anywhere you want. And if you look internally um, inside the, uh, the model, um, for example, this is, a good one. this is a view so the front, this is the, the sea is here, where I am. I ran the glazing through the middle of what was the seating area that could also be filled and become like a jacuzzi. So you could have it indoor or out by sliding the windows open. But what's lovely is, and you can see it now if I zoom in, this is what I love again. Ooh, look at that. It's <laughs> unreal, no? And, and of course, this is an SLA, and uh, you might not realize it, but this, probably not now, but a year and a half ago, this was the world's most complicated SLA. This took four computers one month to build by Land Rover. Yeah? I mean, it was big, it was made in sections, but it was unreal. It was like uh, this honeycomb thing. And, uh, may, uh, may, well, that's a long story, but the, 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 the whole matrix, the way that you go from one surface, which you know is a floor surface to a wall, through the same material and process, and then, for example, in all these zones, in, in like the bathroom zone, you can fill each one of those with a milky silicone. Yeah, and then when, for example, you can use ceramic tiles where the garage area is inside, and then in the living space, you can even we did samples for them with wool. When you buy wool in in yeah? You can, find, you, you can pixelate the floor with wool. I even did plug-in ceramic sofas, which had like gel pads and God knows what. Anyway, that's uh, a venture that I made. Um, you know, there's some other views when you, when you, get, in, when you get in close. It's quite lovely. Again, just th this is an SLA, this, and these are microscopic. But, uh, you know, how to how to possibly section these things out and see how they interconnect. Um, and that could, that could become injection molded, it could be anything. And for example, uh, if you put this together with the work that I showed you with Herman Miller, yeah, uh, with the honeycomb systems, this has been a sort of uh, recurring theme in what I do because there's a lot of logic in it, how to, make, how to connect structures with beauty and, and, and to a certain extent the logic. Um, I can show you a bit of Sendai while I'm, while I'm here. Um, and you obviously know the building. So let me see what we've got. So, yeah. Um, I first saw this project in the, the, the Biennale in Venice. And it was shown in the Arsenal, I remember. And uh, what, what struck me as being, uh, you know, I've an industrial design position. What struck me as being remarkable uh, was the honesty with which he delivered the project. He showed the competition entry as it was. And week by week, there were rolls of paper from the printer just out. 
and they were pinned on this brick wall here and they just rolled on the floor and uh, first of all completely mesmerized by the output the amount of work created secondarily the simplicity of the cardboard models and the whole thing and the generosity in showing all of that and the only model he had was a little acrylic model that was made in layers and they drilled holes through them and then put them together and illuminated and it was so charming and uh, I don't want to get all kind of soppy but it brought a tear to my eye I thought this was one of the most wonderful things this project that I've ever seen in my whole life and then uh, a couple of years later I got a call from Toyo Ito <laughs> who said could I design the top floor for him so I don't know what's going on here but I was really thrilled that he would recognize that we could work together in some way so if you look at this you know if you look through the floors um, you know because Karen Rashid did this floor and this floor I think and then Sajima did that floor I think um, my top floor it was in many ways the most difficult because it had to perform very serious functions so this is a media tech so you know I had to work out ways to store and deliver and supply uh, kilometers of information in various formats so it was really a functional project that I was given and if you look at the building here it's my layer is green yeah? yes and um, there's a reason for that I thought what I would do it, it, bit corny but I thought I'd create a garden of knowledge which meant that when you came up in the lift and you came out what you registered was green and against the blue sky it had this kind of very strong impact and what struck me about the building going there with Ito was this wonderful sequencing of scale which means that you go from these net like columns with a particular diameter down in scale so I thought what I would do is I would keep that moving and I go from the a thick diameter tube right down to human scale so I had to produce furniture that creates screening and seating for people to sit and watch videos and so on so I basically centered them around um, these amazing net columns which were delivering all sorts of services through the building um, as a gesture towards Ito not, not, not kind of coming in in an arrogant way with these big, big, big forms or anything it's just a gentle way of scaling down to the human being and um, I mean you probably can't see very much but if you get in there well that's not bad but you get in there you can see these are all my desks and then the shelving system and uh, the shelving systems what's lovely in Japan is that you know it seems to me that most things are possible you say could I have this please and they say yes <laughs> um, and you kind of go to the toilet and think God, yeah, they said yes and then, you, know, you know so basically they, they'll weld the, 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 the stems for the st storage into the floor and then cover it with the carpet which is uh, that's fantastic and so you get this clean you get these fresh springtime sprouts you know that, that come out um, <laughs> anyway. so you can see that there's this kind of garden quality to it these are these screens these, you know, big, big screens. And, uh, okay, right the way through. So, yeah. All right. And then if you, if you go in, you start to see, you know, that, that's all the shelving and everything. So you can see, the, you know, the, they, they just bring it out of the carpet. That's fantastic. Yeah. And they just make these things. I mean, you send them drawings and you arrive and it's made. I don't, I mean, it's like being God. It's fantastic. <laughs> and I've been working for three years on my new studio and it's hopeless in London trying to get anything made if you're a small fish and you're not, you're only making one. It, it's impossible. But in Japan, I, I've, I've toyed with the idea of going out to live there for a while um, and, and selling my building and building an amazing organic building in Japan in carbon fiber. Go, go for it, you know because I don't know where, you can, California I think and, and, and Japan that's where they understand precision and I went with Sajima one time to the Sony house he did that wonderful small house and the, the night they were taking the, the scaffolding off and there were builders in there with white gloves on and super glue finishing it <laughs> if you go to my building now in Notting Hill there's guys with a cigarette and they're, and they're ripping something out of the wall as we speak <laughs> I don't get it. And I'm trying to build these precise, beautiful objects. 
And I think buildings have to be built in another way. I really do. So, anyhow. So. I'll be, I'll be, uh, I'll draw this to a bit of a close. Um, oh, but you should have a quick look at that. Hang on. This, uh, this, I was, it may be designer of the year in Cologne a couple of years ago. So I, I made an exhibition using uh, the tube story. And uh, it, it was looking at the metamorphosis of materials. So basically these are all polycarbonate tubes. And this is what you get when you put these things on mass. It becomes like cathedral-like. And they're very strong. I mean, this is just for an exhibition. But what I, what I showed here was I started with polycarbonate. I started with aluminium, actually. Went to polycarbonate and finished with bamboo. And I put associated products that I designed in material terms related to the base. That was the sort of thing. Okay. I'll show you. I'll finish on two things. I'll just show you uh, um, I'll show you this water bottle, which um, this is uh, this is an acrylic model. Uh, T Nant, uh, the Welsh water company. I'm Welsh, and I never thought I'd ever do anything in Wales as long as I live, because I only have sheep and Tom Jones down there, so not much going on, I'm afraid. And uh, I thought it was a joke when they called me, but it, it's owned. The company's owned by an Italian, so <laughs> there's a spirit, you know, uh, Pietro. So they said, "Look, Mr. Lovegrove, we we have this blue bottle, which is an icon, and uh, we want that's glass, and we'd like to do a, a plastic high volume product." And you're the one, you know. So, thank you. Um, uh, and it would be very easy of me, in a very stark, Philippe Stark type sense, to just take the blue bottle, give it a funny shape, well, half a day on a computer, rotational shape, easy, yeah, and, and sell it to him because, you know, I'm known. And I could say to him, this is what you should have, trust me, I'm known, I, yeah. I mean, <laughs> and, no, no, and, I, no, and you, get, you, know, you get about 80,000 pounds to design a bottle like that. 80. Right? Yeah, okay, all right. <laughs> if you knew how much they make, you, you would, I would put zeros on the end of that now. Anyway, anyway, uh, but listen to me, because it's all part of the story, the, the, the money thing. Um, could have done that in a week. Yeah, yeah, easy. I mean, it's, you know, I know how people do this stuff. So, and this is technology which is basically like, like a balloon. You know, you, you have a little plastic thing, you heat it up, it's got a thread on it. You heat it up, you blow air into it, and it assumes whatever shape is there. So it's very easy. Um, but most of the bottles which exist on the market, the, the plastic ones, Vital and so on, they are an affront to the process and human beings. They, those those bottles are designed uh, first and foremostly to fit on the machine, uh, to fit in a pallet in the factory, uh, to fit in, in the truck, and to be stacked on a shelf in a supermarket. They have no relationship whatsoever to the beauty of the process and what they contain. Because we can live without food for a while, but we can't live without water. Water is, means everything to us. So I, I'll tell you this. I spent three months on this project looking for crushable bottles. I was trying to save 3% of the material. I was, in, I was really trying to do it. And he came back to me and I said to him, look Pietro, I said, thank you very much. I said, but I can't do this project. I cannot find a reason. How, I don't know how to do it. I, I, I just, I'm not sure. I, clouds deliver water better than bottles ever would or should or could. Yeah. And, it, you know, I, you know, I'm, I have a strong moral and ethic to me, and I don't even know why I design products because I hate them most of the time. So, it's perhaps doing the odd building might be more sustainable than doing all this crap. So, I I was ill that year, quite seriously ill, and I I went to Thailand to do some yoga and to eat well and to try and get over this. And uh, I took one book on the water studies of Leonardo, and I took one book on Irving Penn's photographs of Issey Miyake's pieces closed. Yeah. And uh, I was looking for the essence of water. And uh, basically I came back and I made a few studies as I normally do by hand in my workshop 
digitize them, play with them. Because the thing is that water manifests itself either as an ocean, a lake, a river, a stream, a pond. It comes out of a tap. It's snow. It's ice. It's mist. Water is incredible. So how do you define what means water in society? And basically, I got to this point where this is a CNC machined, polished acrylic model of my dream. Yeah? And of course, the client thought that was remarkable. Yeah? <laughs> now, you will never know if it's going to look like that until the day it comes out of the machine. You can't guess. Yeah? So this is how we started. And some of the data for developing this is very nice. I mean, um, just 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 show you because this is not sort of a quick five-minute thing. You know how to look at the part line of the mold and how you how you map the surfaces. Um, uh, you know that that would be lovely blown up big on a wall. I uh, make a carpet out of that or so. I just kind of you know, and I won't do my magnifying trick. But when you get in there, <laughs> it's another world. I'd love to just do a book on. Get in there, you know. Let's call it get in there. Or something. Um, yeah, fab. And then, you know, and then you take that, which is sort of a clearer view of the thing. Yeah? It's, you know, it's kind of hybrid, you know. It's half thing you know and half thing you don't know. But then what you do is, it, it was just an exercise, but if you, if you surface that, wow, that's a car, right? That's a, you know, you went in, if you zoom in on that and blow it up, that's a car. That's, wow, you know. So, and you can do that. They, they didn't need that, but you, you, could, you could do a product like that. But, for example, that, that was the tooling. Yeah, I'll show you the tooling, which is in aluminium. Those are the tools. Right? They're like Richard Serra's some organic thing. Right? And I must tell you this, that San Benedetto is the company that makes most of the water in Europe. They're in Italy. And I took them that bottle design, and they insulted me in front of the client. They said, who is this man? He doesn't know what he's talking about. He obviously d never designed a bottle before in his life. And they didn't physically throw us out, but they asked us to leave. And in the car, you wouldn't want to be in that car, because, I mean, we didn't talk. This is my, and I, this took 14 months. <laughs> yeah? You know? So the, the 80 grand by that time was, I was paying for it. I mean, that, that was, seemed like a lot in one week, but after 14 months. So, I found a tooling company in Britain that would do this. So this is all done in Britain. Stuff the Italians, because they wanted an easy life. That's what they wanted. And most, in what you find in industrial design, is everybody wants an easy life, because they, they want to go home at five o'clock. To get things made that are extraordinary, from a transparent chair by Philippe for cartel, or what, you really have to be persuasive. Yeah? And you know, in a way, when this thing arrived, they, they, you know, they sent me a bottle. And the bottle came, obviously, without water. And I thought, what is this now? And you know, I get sent stuff all the time. And, uh, and it, I, opened, I was at home, and I opened it up, and it had no gravitas, yeah, because it was just a transparent piece of plastic. And I just, I melted. I thought, oh, I failed. And it was a sunny day, I remember. And I filled it up with water, and I put it on tape. Amazing. It just became the, the acrylic again. So I mean, that is a manufactured object, yeah? which you can buy at Tesco for a quid, right? And if I go to Japan, I'm not kidding you, I, go, you know, I gave a lecture to Toyota not so long ago, I had a queue of people and I have to sign the bottle. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. The first, the first six bottles actually went to all Japanese, Miyake and people, my friends, you know, for that. And, and I, you know, I'm mobbed for water in Japan, but I mean, that's, uh, that's the real thing. Okay. Pardon? <laughs> they, they got more than they ever want, actually. <laughs> They're overwhelmed with, with water. Yeah. Um, okay, I promised one thing, but I'm going to give you two. Uh, I'll give you three, actually, if I've seen this. This is my go chair for, uh, for Bernhardt in the US. This is made from magnesium. And this is a company that makes wooden beds in St. Louis world's first magnesium chair. And that was all done by I with uh, Hiromichi Kono, my assistant in a little white coat. He doesn't speak any English. And so basically, if, if I want him to, to make a little bit more shape in this area, I'll have to kneel down and, and pretend I'm blowing it. 
and then you'll get it. But, I mean, it's got this, this is other way of communicating. And uh, this went through three full-size models, and then we worked with uh, a company in Germany to do all the Vitra products, and then it's all scanned, and we take half the chair and mirror it and all that. And this went in Time magazine in 2001 as one of the most sensational things of the last 50 years or something. And it's become a kind of icon. Um, but that's, these are my lines. That's the way I, because I feel extremely emotive when I see forms like this. And if you, if you look at them, they're like skeletons. If you look at the uh, skeleton of a, of a Tyrannosaurus rex, what nature does, it, it puts holes in, it takes out the material you absolutely do not need. And I think if you can relate that to new growth patterns, so perhaps you could grow forms to a kind of upscaled stereolithography or something and make them rigid post-treatments, I don't know, get forms which really more, that are more grown than constructed. That is one of my long-term dreams. Um, and this is how, you know, uh, that, that'll, these are, you know, this is how I draw the, the things, you know. Um, but these are all hand modeled. Um, and then, I'm just going to show you this. Okay. Yeah. This is all my shared form research. This is a car, yeah? And the idea here, you can't really work this one out probably, but this is the seat and this is the back and that's the seat and there's another hole there and they go right through the car. And what they do is they unite external structure with internal structure to create monocoque ideas. And these are rather conceptual, uh, but this is where all my grab stuff w was, this idea of shared form. Uh, not easy to, to construct. Uh, but if you look at shapes that exist in nature, like that water droplet, that's a perfect shape for a car. In terms of head height, dimensions, the way it sits on the ground, it's absolutely beautiful. And some years ago I worked for Peugeot on a, on a new car. And I spent three months on it, and they said I could choose what car it was. And they came to the studio and I presented them with um, a 3.5 meter inflatable egg hanging from the ceiling, ceiling um, with some weird mu mu music playing uh, at 8 o'clock at night on a Friday uh, with pictures of fetuses projected onto it. And they said, well, where's the model of the car? I said, well, that's the, that's the car. And they said, well, no, that's not a car. I said, that's the car. I said, well, that's the philosophy of a car. If you like the philosophy, we'll do a car. And they never came back. Uh, <laughs> it's true. It's true. It's true, I scare them all off. And that was, that was a day later with just my son. But the, uh, the inflate guys made that for me. So <laughs> anyway, well, I, you know, I can produce a beautiful object, silver or whatever, with leather seats in it, but I don't think the world needs that. So I've been looking at this car. It's a kind of pet project of mine. And this is the amalgam of a few of those ideas, the shape of the water droplet, the shared structure. So what you have is a carbon fiber base, and this is sucked in and forms that beam, which then creates these seats, which if they were too hard, you just kind of put some elastomeric in there. But it's a mono object, so it means that, you know, for, for front or rear impact, it's incredibly strong, but it's super lightweight. And you notice there's no engine in it, there's nothing in it. And that's because these are the engines. They're two disc batteries, and they plug in like Formula One, which means you go in your garage, you take one off, you plug it in, and you put another one on, of course, and there's a ball wheel in the front. And there, there's, you know, self-propelling wheels, so you don't have any engine in it. And what's nice is it's got this bread bin top, which means that you can open it one way or the other, so for e easy access. And this bit at the back is a solar panel, and I'll show you why. Um, this, this is because it does this. Um, it's a street light. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, nobody's ever looked at the relationship of cars within society. And, you know, the ground level should be for people and dogs and whatever. So, 
you drive along, no, I'm serious, you drive along, you've got to get out, of course, but this thing has got like a, a, a slice through it and it, it's horizontal. You drive onto the spike and the spike kind of lifts up and the solar panel collects energy and at night it's a street light. You use the street, you leave the lights in the car to create lights. You see. As daft as that sounds, that is not a bad idea because it's using all... No, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not. I didn't come here to be laughed at. Um, so, no, I tried to get a bit serious with this. So I thought, what would it look like next to the MediaTek in Sendai? So I, I calmed it down, I did. Let me show you what I got here. Um, so I looked at, um, at this, because I, I thought, well, perhaps the car could become more like a marble. So when you throw them, when, when, like, when they're driving, they go forward, but they actually rotate. Yeah? So you use up all the available space. And it has a battery pack in it, and these three ball wheels, and this is the seat, and this is the back, yeah, this is the seat rather, and that's the back. And to get in, it's, it's very easy because the, the top rotates. And then right on the top is the solar panel again. And what you do is this. I mean, I think it could be more refined as a design, but that, in principle, that's the plan. Yes, yeah, so that's the plan of the car. And then if you see it, in, in a kind of context. It's not bad, no, I mean, that, those could be cars. Yeah, so they, I've got these kind of weird sideline dreams, and I, you know, I've lectured to the master and all these people, and they, you know, I tell them what they do is terrible, and they, they got it all wrong, and that they should be trying these kind of things. I mean, it costs a billion dollars to produce a car, as a program, that's a thousand million. What would it cost to produce something like that? I mean, I don't know. I don't know, a million? I, I don't know. I mean, I have models and prototypes made all the time. I mean, there's nothing to it. So, I mean, wouldn't it be great fun to have a kind of supporter? Just to try an idea like that. What you do is you drive over this pin, which is in the floor now, you can see. It's a hydraulic pin. You get out and it just goes straight up. So, I mean, you know, it could be made. Anyway, to finish, I'll show you... I got some shots of the new studio. I've been working on um, this staircase, which um, for about a year and a half now. And this is the assembly of this new staircase in my in my new studio space. So I've just been working on this thing, and it's a modular step unit. Okay, so that was that, and then. I've got some just simple screenshots from my video camera here, um, which uh, oh, let's go back in there. I think. Oh yeah, okay. So this, yeah, this was the intent. This was the first idea to produce a staircase like this, which is. Um, made from individual moldings. It, 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 there's a process called bladder molding, which, which means that you make an aluminium tool and you put, you put, this is composite material, so you put them in as a mat with the resin and then you put this rubber bag in and you blow it un, up under incredible pressure and it forces all the resin through the matrix and it creates amazing surfaces. I mean, it's used for Formula One. And this is being made for me by a company in Southampton. And um, so what I've been looking at is how to take away anything extraneous. Yeah, I'm not an engineer, but I have a kind of instinct for these things. And I do enjoy the concept of bones, um, the evolution of bone uh, structure. But what's interesting here, in order to get e extra ma uh, maximum strength, is I've incorporated this inner handrail. And I mean, as you can appreciate, that's quite a complex data to, it, to, to, to produce that. And um, so what I've got, um, there's, a, there's an external handrail in carbon fiber which follows it. Because what I've been trying to do, this is the break in the ceiling. Uh, this is about four and a half meters now. Um, and then you've got another three meters above. This, this carbon fiber comes out of the ceiling spiral and goes into the floor. It's trying to produce an unsupported handrail. Uh, uh, yeah. 
and I'll see what I've got here. Um, what is, I don't, don't think this is it. Let me just see. You don't seem to be it. Studio. That's it. Ah, okay. This is it. These are just screenshots, like I say, from my video camera, so they're, they're not perfect. Okay. This is the real thing. And as you, you see, there's two supports. I've got two supports. There's uh, one here, and then there's another one. Uh, but what I'm trying to do is I present people with a, an image of a dream, and then I bloody well try and make it look exactly the way it is. And I'm telling you, that is very difficult. And I do that with Japan Airlines. I do it with everybody. The model and the real thing, almost identical. Because I don't like to cheat people with what I call airfix kit culture. And for any of you who've been given one of those wonderful boxes with, a, I don't know, a Harrier jump jet or a, some kind of amazing boat or something, and you open it up and there's bits of plastic in there. The, the image on the front does not relate to what is inside. And I think we don't need to compromise. I think there, there are chances, like with the bottle and other things, um, to prove that what you show is, is absolutely possible to deliver. With, with economies of scale and so on. Um, so, yeah. So there we go. Just, I'll just run through these. It's just, it's just, okay, yeah. And all the work surfaces in my studio have this bubble honeycomb that comes from Japan. And so on. It's fantastic material and, and then what you do is you you skin it with uh, acrylics and you, you'll see I think uh, the optical lighting effect is, is very nice uh, this is underground so I have this lighting system which was developed for the nuclear industry in the States um, which basically gives you natural daylight it changes the program and um, yeah you can see this is all this work surface here uh, cantilevered That's it. Thank you very much. No, no one or two questions? Yeah, I can have some questions. Okay. If there's any. I know it's very late, but if there's urgent questions, one or two, you, we, should, we should listen. Uh, before you ask any questions, the, I thought I'd bring this along. Yeah. yeah. The water bottle, which has disappeared, that, um, that's the same technology. Yeah? That's, uh, that's a blow molding. Um, so you start with a plastic thing, you heat it up, and you blow it. And uh, I suppose you can get twice the scale of that. But the optical quality of that are really wonderful. I don't know if you want to have a look at that. Yes. Oh, a child. Yeah. Well, you're not going to ask me about the extension next door, are you? Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, there is a label on it which is transparent. Yeah. No, no, there is a label on it. But what what I've done is, um, yeah, it. Uh, yeah, of course, this is always the problem with with those things because you have a lot of information to display because it's a food stuff. Um, and the problem is, believe it or not, is Belgium, because Belgium apparently has the, the highest standards in, uh, uh, or, or need for information on the bottle. So what I, what I managed to get T-Nant to do was to put a little thing at the top at the back, take it over the, the screw cap and down onto the front. So basically information is there. Yeah, but you take that off when you use it, so you don't have that horrible kind of thing in the middle. It does have my name on it, but they put it so imperceptibly small. It's you know, Roman goes to school and tries to show his friends, and nobody can see it, so it doesn't make any difference. Oh, yeah. um, for your 3D modeling, I mean, fantastic stuff. But how, what program are you using to get all those, those rendering 3D modeling? 
Well, you know, I was, I was scared stiff of anybody asking me those questions here because, you know, the, these institutions are, are full of people who are whiz kids, all that sort of stuff. We work, we work with a series of um, programs. We don't have a, you know, one singular program, which is like a studio program. Um, what I, I, I mean, I work with Alias. Yeah? Alias is a very good program for going from screen to um, rapid prototyping, cutting of tools and manufacture. Alias is known uh, a bit like Pro Engineer as being a very good program to go from product to manufacture. Having said that, I'm driving my lot crazy because, you know, I was out with, uh, with Patrick and, and Zaha and a few people out at Graz not so long ago for a crit. And the, the, some of the work that the students do there is unreal. I mean, with, with various programs like Maya and so on, which have uh, the potential to create incredible forms. Okay. I mean, I don't know enough about how to go from those programs to real product within my world. But I'm curious, as I'm trying to pro uh, kind of project myself to you today, I'm somebody that has a, an absolute passionate belief in crossing over worlds. Yeah? So I'm trying to look at how I perhaps could use Maya in my world to open up my, my thinking. And of course, I get uh, yeah, five out of ten clients who call me all want my water bottle type design, whatever it is I'm designing. And of course, that was designed for a water bottle. It wasn't designed for a pen or anything, you know. So I need to be sure how you use form intelligently because it can go, it can be really vulgar. So I don't want to be so seduced that I start losing my logical path. But I do realize that there's a crossover between product studio thinking and uh, architectural practice thinking because I'm really turned on by what I, what I see with people like... Uh, Greg and, you know, Hanny and these people, it's amazing things, really. I'm sure you do fantastic things here. So, you know, I mean, if you, if you ever want to know more, you speak to Tim, Tim Williamson on 0207-229-7104, and he'll tell you everything. He's probably working now. Yeah, Tim Williamson, 0207-229-7104. Okay. Anything else? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.